Hello, everyone. Sorry for uh, the late start there. We had a few technical difficulties, but it's all working now. Um, so my name is James Barclay. Um, I'm here with my colleagues uh, Nick Mooney and Alabade Aniche to talk about um, some of the research we did into the difficulty of validating X509 certificate chains using re uh, readily available tooling, advice, and libraries on the internet. Um, some scenarios where developers may be expected to uh, validate certificate chains on their own and the implications of getting that wrong and how it can be exploited. Um, and then we're also going to talk about how widely used one of these uh, APIs where developers are expected to validate certificate chains is. So um, first things first, I'm just going to quickly cover the, uh, the agenda here. Um, I'll start by talking about X509 uh, certificates and certification path validation. Um, then I'll cover uh, just a quick overview of Android SafetyNet, um, which is one of those APIs I was talking about earlier um, that uh, expects developers to validate certificate chains as part of um, its intended usage. Um, then I'll talk about JSON web signatures. Um, we'll have uh, Nick come up and talk about um, the Pi Open SSL uh, cryptographic library and uh, the X509 store class. Then we'll talk about bad advice on the internet, misuse resistance, quantifying the use of safety net, and then we'll have a demo that shows how to forge safety net out of stations. Um, so b b before I dive in too far, though, um, I want to start with a story to just hopefully demonstrate why we think um, validating certificate chains is a hard problem and why people make mistakes. Um, so if, if you're familiar with the paper Why Johnny uh, Can Encrypt, uh, maybe just reimagine that as like why Johnny can't properly validate certificate chains. Um, so here's Johnny. Um, Johnny is a software developer. Um, and one day while developing an anti-abuse feature for his mobile application, um, uh, Johnny is uh, you know, working with an API that has a required certificate chain validation step. Um, and uh, because his uh, application server backend is written in Python, as any good developer does, he searches Google for verify certificate chain Python. Um, Johnny's a little confused at first because there's some conflicting information, um, you know, and, uh, but, but eventually he finds something that works. Um, you know, uh, Johnny has a, you know, a case where um, with a known good uh, certificate chain, it validates su uh, successfully, um, and then in, an, uh, in the case of a known bad one, it, it does not. Um, so maybe Johnny even writes tests for this, um, has other people review it, um, Johnny's happy, and he ships the feature. Unfortunately, there's a security bug in Johnny's code. Um, Johnny might never know, though, because everything just keeps working. Um, so I'm going to take a step back now and just talk about X509 uh, certificates and certificate chains. Um, so fundamentally, um, a certificate is an identity that's associated with a key pair. Um, and other parties are able to uh, make claims about that identity. Um, the, the identity can be an entity such as like a, a computer or a, you know, uh, a user or some other entity. Um, additionally, metadata such as uh, subject name, uh, SANS, uh, valid doma uh, domain names in, in the TLS context, um, as well as organization info are included or can be included, um, as well as uh, issuer info when not self-signed. Um, so uh, there's, you know, of course, the so-called so chain of trust, you know, uh, um, Validating certificate chains, or I'm sorry, validating end entity certificates individually would quickly become untenable. So the chain of trust allows us to uh, assess the trustworthiness of certificates that are anchored in a, a, a root of trust. Um, of course, root CAs um, ship with the operating system in many cases, sometimes the browser. Um, these are explicitly trusted and used to sign other certificates, um, usually intermediate uh, certificates. Um, intermediates are not globally trusted, but part of a chain that leads to uh, a root or a trust anchor. And then leaf certificates or so-called end entity certificates uh, represent the end of the chain um, and cannot be used to sign other certificates. Um, in the case of something like uh, Android safety net, um, that key pair is used to sign a safety net attestation. So um, from a high level, uh, the things you need to worry about for uh, when validating a certificate chain, uh, things like uh, the um, the root CA must be self-signed and not explicitly trusted. Um, it must have also signed the next intermediate in the chain if one exists, um, which must have signed the next and so on. Um, and then finally, the last intermediate must have signed the client leaf or end entity certificate. Um, we also need to worry about 
um, making sure that uh, the LEAF certificate legitimately describes the service. Um, for example, the common name, um, the subject alternative name. And then making sure that the intermediates are allowed to issue chains of n length, as well as worry about, uh, you know, we have to worry about ex expiration and validity. So there's a lot. Um, and uh, this is actually a, um, a snippet from uh, uh, the RFC, which describes how to validate certificate chains. As you can see, it can get pretty complicated rather quickly. Um, now, cryptographic libraries generally ease the pain quite a bit. Um, but some abstractions are leaky, and uh, developers can you know, pretty easily shoot themselves in the foot. So when should developers actually have to worry about validating certificate chains um, directly themselves? And our argument is probably never. Um, of course, uh, you know, we're not going to be able to get rid of this entirely. You know, there are going to be cases where um, your average software developer is going to need to themselves uh, uh, ver uh, validate a certificate chain. Um, but it's not all that reasonable to, um, to expect that of, of all of them. <laughs> um, so, but on the other uh, hand, what, when might developers actually currently have to worry about validating certificate chains? Um, so three things that come to mind. This is by no means exhaustive, of course. Um, but uh, we're, uh, Android safety net, Android protected confirmation, and then WebAuthn uh, when uh, using um, attestation to verify the provenance of an authenticator. So knowing that certificate chain validation is kind of hard and it's easy to get wrong, um, let's just look at one um, API where there is a, a, a required certificate chain validation step and how that might go wrong. So this is from um, Google's uh, documentation on SafetyNet. Um, it's, it describes SafetyNet as a set of services and APIs that help protect your app uh, against security threats, including device tampering, bad URLs, potentially harmful apps, and fake users. Um, there are four distinct uh, SafetyNet APIs. There's the so-called SafetyNet Attestation API, the Safe Browsing API, the Recaptcha API, and then the Verify Apps API. Um, so unless otherwise noted, though, um, we'll just be talking about the safety net attestation API in this talk. So again, uh, from Google's documentation, they describe safety net as an API, uh, an anti-abuse API that allows developers to assess the Android device that their app is running on. Um, and this can be used as part of a, a larger anti-abuse uh, uh, system to determine whether servers are interacting with genuine, uh, a genuine app on genuine Android uh, devices. Um, and the way that it achieves this is by uh, providing a cryptographically signed attestation that can be cryptographically verified. Um, so from a very high level, the way safety net, uh, or the safety net attestation API works, rather, is that um, the server will request a, ad, uh, an attestation from a mobile device. Then the mobile device will do some health checks and produce a signed blob. Uh, next, the mobile device will provide a, a JSON web signature along with the uh, intermediate certificates and uh, to the application server. And then the application server will check the payload and validate the signature against the chain. Um, next, I'm going to talk about uh, JSON web signatures, which I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, so JSON web signatures are part of the Jose framework, or uh, a family of standards, um, along with things like JWT and JWE, or JOT, if you prefer. Um, JSON web signatures represent content secured in uh, digital signatures, or MACs, uh, and they use a JSON-based data structure. Um, and this is uh, described in RFC 7515. So uh, a JWS is a named tuple that consists of three values. There is the Jose header, the payload, and the signature. Um, and there are two serialization formats that are supported. There's the JSON serialization and compact serialization. So uh, this is from RFC 7515. The compact serialization is described as the base64 URL encoded concatenation of the JWS header, or Jose header, um, the payload and signature um, with, uh, concatenated with dots. So that's what a um, you know, JWS compact uh, format may look like. Um, in this case, we have uh, the, the Jose header, which says the type is JWT, and the algorithm is HS256. You might also see RS256. Um, this is also, importantly, where you would uh, in, uh, insert the, uh, the X5C header parameter to include uh, a certificate chain. Um, the payload is the payload that you want signed, which uses a, a JSON data format. Uh, 
And then the signature uh, comes last, and that uh, signature depends, uh, the, the, the format of which depends on the, the signature algorithm used. And now I'm going to talk specifically how SafetyNet uh, uses JSON web signatures. Um, so here we have a, a, an example SafetyNet JWS payload. Um, it includes something, you know, things like the announce, the timestamp, the uh, APK package name. Um, but then uh, I've highlighted this uh, CTS profile match and basic integrity uh, uh, keys here. Um, what this basically signals is in the attestation that is provided to the application server and is cryptographically verified, this says, uh, you know, basic integrity um, signals that the device is not rooted. Um, and CTS profile matches like a more rigorous test that um, ensures that the device has run through Google's like compatibility test suite uh, of software. Um, and here's a snippet of things to look out for, checklist items when implementing safety net. And this is like documentation targeted at mobile developers, right? So um, as you can see, there's a lot of stuff here, and that's you know like maybe those mobile developers don't have much knowledge of uh, cryptography. It's there's talk of things like nonces and uh, you know uh, certificate hashes and um, so on and so forth, like uh, attestation responses. So like just a lot of things that developers may have heard of, but there's just a lot to unpack there. Um, and a lot of chances to get things wrong. Um, and then th this I mentioned earlier is the, uh, this is actually from the um, uh, RFC 7515, the uh, JSON web signature uh, spec, um, which describes how the X5C uh, header parameter is used. And this is what um, you would provide in a JSON web signature to say, like, um, you know, here's a, here's a list of, uh, of n intermediates uh, and then my uh, end entity certificate. And then you can use that along with a, uh, a chain of trust um, that is, that, or sorry, a, a root of trust, rather, on the application server to verify the signature. And importantly, SafetyNet does this. It includes the X509 certificate chain in the JWS header. Um, now, um, Nick is going to come up and talk about um, how certain cryptographic libraries handle certificate chain validation, uh, as well as uh, go into misuse resistance um, and uh, uh, like pr primitives in APIs. Thank you. All right, thanks so much. So I'm going to chat a little bit about uh, PyOpenSSL, uh, which is a fairly common library used to implement certain cryptographic tasks, uh, and specifically the X509 store, which is the class that handles certificate validation. Uh, there's an observation here that was really the genesis of our research into this topic. To give some background, PyOpenSSL is part of the Python Cryptographic Authority, uh, so you might know them from other great projects like cryptography. PyOpenSSL is essentially just a wrapper around the native OpenSSL library. Interestingly enough, the Python Cryptographic Authority recommends not using PyOpenSSL for anything other than just making TLS connections. Uh, they favor their cryptography library, which is a little bit higher level. But it's important to note that the cryptography library doesn't actually support all of the functionality that's exposed to PyOpenSSL. So PyOpenSSL ends up the, being the choice that people need to make. There are two classes here, the X509 store and the X509 store context. Uh, to give a brief overview of them, the X509 store is used to describe a context in which to verify a certificate, so it sort of represents the uh, roots of trust. And then the X509 store context is used to actually carry out the actual verification of a certificate. Um, in my opinion, these names should be kind of swapped. I think they do exactly the opposite of what they say on the tin, uh, but that's neither here nor there. Here's a cursory glance for someone how someone might implement certificate chain validation in Python using the PyOpenSSL APIs. What's happening here is we're parsing a root cert, an intermediate cert, and a leaf cert. We're instantiating a store. We're adding the root and the intermediate to the store. And then we're instantiating an X509 store context to validate that leaf certificate. This is actually really wrong. What's happening here is that the root certificate and intermediate certificate are both globally trusted. And so the question you might ask is, well, why would you do it that way if it's so clearly wrong? And the answer really is that, one, there's no easy way to do it the right way. And two, pretty much every piece of advice on the internet that exists uh, to tell people how to accomplish this task uses this pattern, including the unit tests in PyOpenSSL. Again, this pattern treats any, any intermediate certificates as trusted routes. The assumptions you might have about certificate chain validation are something that it works like this. You have a root, an intermediate, and a leaf. Um, and 
ideally, if the intermediate and the leaf are controlled by an adversary, you should still be okay, right? An adversary should not be able to construct a certificate chain that chains up to one of your globally trusted routes. This is how developers think it's working. We've got a good intermediate, a good leaf, we can successfully validate the certificate. If we have a rogue intermediate, uh, nothing's gonna happen, right? It's gonna be a failure. How it actually works in practice is that the happy path works, right? A valid certificate chain will validate if this uh, messy pattern is implemented. And actually the naive bad case will fail, right? So the, the, the happy path works, the naive bad case fails where you just have an invalid signature. But this specifically targeted adversarial case will validate. If an adversary is able to control the intermediate certificates that are provided to you, uh, and this pattern is implemented, uh, intermediates that are issued by adversaries will successfully validate leafs. They'll be treated as globally trusted. Like I said, there's still no good way to do this. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, specifically what that looks like. And I also want to point out that we actually also made the same mistake uh, in the development of a prototype recently. Um, we were lucky enough to catch it in development and get to talk a blackout about it, uh, but not everyone is so lucky. So really the genesis of this is when our colleague Adam Goodman ran into the same limitation in the PyOpen SSL API. Right? He wanted to validate a certificate chain and provide PyOpen SSL with a list of untrusted intermediates they would be conditionally trusted based on their ability to be chained up to trusted routes. He found that we couldn't do this and actually opened a PR in June of 2016 attempting to fix this uh, by extending the API. This still hasn't been merged in. Um, it's not really for lack of caring by the project maintainers. It's a sensitive change in a cryptographic library. There's not that many people that are qualified to make these changes, uh, which is a great reason. But the fact still exists that this PR has been sitting since 2016, and people are still actively using this library and implementing this pattern. So in our code, we end up just using a, a local fork that implements this PR. I want to talk also about the right way to do things with this sort of non-obvious API. It's rare enough that the only example that we're familiar with uh, that's sort of big enough of using PyOpenSSL to correctly validate a certificate chain is in the tests in Let's Encrypt's Boulder project. Again, the way they accomplish this isn't totally obvious, um, and it requires an understanding of this issue in the first place. What they're doing here is basically a variation on what we've seen earlier, where they are piece by piece uh, adding certificates to the trust store as they construct a, a context for basically each leaf certificate. Um, sort of validating them along the way. So if you, you have a chain, right, you've already built a path from root to leaf, you know exactly which certificates you'd like to validate, you can validate them sort of piecewise. In this case, the intermediate certificate wouldn't be considered a trusted root until you had validated it against a store that only contained the explicitly trusted roots. One of our big takeaways here is that we should avoid making developers do this themselves. Right? If we have cryptographic tasks that need to happen on the client side, the best way that we can prevent issues like this is by providing libraries, right? not asking developers who aren't cryptographic experts and probably shouldn't be expected to be cryptographic experts. We should avoid asking them to do these tasks. If we are asking them to do these tasks, this is just a list of a, a very non-exhaustive list of some of the things that they have to take into consideration when implementing certificate chain validation. There's path building, right? There's name validation. Um, there's this famous like null byte vulnerability, which I won't go into. There's all sorts of stuff that can kind of uh, go wrong here just in name validation. We have basic constraints, right? So what happens if you have a certificate that uh, was issued as a leaf, but then has issued another certificate? Are you checking that that certificate legitimately should be a CA? Um, and then all sorts of other issues. If you do want to do this, there's some purpose-built software that's great for it. The best example is your web browser, right? It's making TLS connections all day. Your web browser is fantastic at validating certificate chains because that's one of its primary jobs. Your OS also has a battle-tested way to do this, right? I'm sure it'll provide uh, some sort of API for establishing TLS connections. Uh, if you are using Python, there's a cert validator library that's kind of like a much larger project for validating certificate chains. 
But really, if you're implementing something where certificate chains need validation, it's probably in the context of something more specific like JWS. So you might want to use a purpose-built library rather than trying to sort of hand roll this. Now I just want to go over just some more bad advice on the internet. Uh, this is the first result for Golang Verify Certificate Chain, and it's really lovely because you see the whole page of code, and it works perfectly, and then only if you go below the fold, uh, you see this comment that points out this doesn't actually do at all what we're hoping to do here. Right? These uh, certificates that are placed in the root store are trusted completely. Uh, this is one of these original Stack Overflow answers for uh, PyOpen SSL Verify Certificate Chain. Uh, this answer was given in June 18th or June 8th of 2015, and it was the top answer for quite a long time. The first comment that points out that this is legitimately wrong uh, is in March of 2018. This is another Golang library that uh, just checks the flags of a certificate, and if the certificate claims to be a CA, it's added to the, the trusted root store. This is in uh, Intel security libraries for data centers. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, misuse resistance. This is a bit of a, a detour. Uh, and really, what I'm hoping that you walk away with is that if you are designing these protocols where you have to have developers do some tasks, try to choose primitives that are hard to misuse. These can range from legitimate cryptographic primitives to simply techniques for encoding data. Um, at DSA, for example, chose deterministic signatures, and this avoided the uh, PS3 problem of accidentally reusing nonces. AES GCM SIV is, uh, to quote Adam Langley, occasional nonce duplication tolerant. Uh, and then there are also just certain representations of data, such as compressed curve points when doing elliptic curve cryptography, that you can use to avoid things like invalid curve attacks. In most cases, misuse resistance is really reducing the impact of bad randomness or reducing the impact of a developer making a mistake using the tools you've given them. This is really when it uh, sort of transitions to API design mattering a lot. Um, these are just a couple examples of uh, tooling that's available that focuses on misuse resistance. Libsodium is a favorite of mine for accomplishing different cryptographic tasks. Uh, they've designed their API so that it's actually really hard to do the wrong thing. But it's important to note that even in cases like this, the primitives can still fail very spectacularly with things like nonce reuse. There are also implementations of actual misuse resistant primitives. Uh, Tony Arcieri has his miscreant library, which is uh, an implementation of several of Philip Rogaway's uh, misuse resistant primitives. Now I'm going to hand it over to Alabade to talk about quantifying the use of safety net among Android applications. Thanks, Nick. So I'm going to kind of lay out not only how we amassed the list of Android apps that we wanted to download, um, how we went and acquired those apps, and then also the analysis methods that we used to analyze the user safety net. So again, this process starts by trying to get a list of Android apps to download. So unfortunately, there isn't a public source of truth as regards to the maybe top 10,000 Android apps by downloads. There are a lot of sites that maybe that have maybe 10 to 100 lists that you can get in kind of a freemium model. Um, and of course, there's paid services, kind of like App Nanny, that do what is called Play Store Analytics. And they track the downloads maybe over a certain time period, the number of reviews, and the ratings that are uh, associated with it. Because we wanted to make this type of analysis and research um, available to everyone and uh, reproducible, we end up going with a, a service that actually provides us for free. Um, they've been doing since 2011, and that's Android Rank. Um, Android Rank has actually been used in a lot of academic papers, um, such as FDORT, if you're actually familiar with that, um, to conduct these kind of large-scale analysis when it comes to kind of identifying apps that are particularly popular. So um, Android Rank actually has um, about 49 different categories of apps that they kind of uh, provide the rankings for. Um, it's important to note that 32 of these categories are what they call general categories. So you'll be thinking of this kind of like communication, um, comics, uh, dating, things of that sort. They have 17 different uh, gaming categories. So that would be like action and adventure, maybe fighting or puzzles. Um, as part of this list, um, it's important to note that they only uh, rank the top 500 apps in each one of these categories. And another stipulation or constraint is that these apps must have at least 5 million downloads. So with those 49 different categories, we were able to amass a list of about 24,296 applications 
And you may be thinking, okay, that math doesn't add up 49 times 500. Um, the reason is there are certain categories that didn't have the threshold of 500 apps uh, with 5 million um, downloads. And one example category for that was lifestyle. So now that we have a list of apps, the next thing is to kind of go acquire those apps and those APKs so we can actually do this analysis. So we were going to start by trying to see, okay, can we download all of these apps from the Google Play Store? And unfortunately, because some of these apps were only available in certain regions, we would have had to mask our IP to kind of download each one of those applications. And that was a bit of complexity that we didn't kind of want to deal with. And so we actually ended up resorting to what are called uh, Play Store mirroring sites. And these sites allow um, Android users to download maybe previous versions or a beta versions of particular applications, um, and they can sideload them. Um, the two sites that we end up using were APK Pure and APK Monk. There are like tons of sites that you can do this um, and kind of instrument this for, um, but these two are really easy to operate with. So using these particular sources, we were able to download about 98% of the 24,000 apps. So it was about 23,800 or so. Um, so we were pretty successful with that. Um, and actually, some of this code is a part um, of what we're going to open source today. And Nick will talk about this later. Um, so now that we've acquired the apps and we had our lists, now let's talk about actually analyzing and trying to see which apps are actually using safety net. So I'm not sure what people's familiarity with um, Android or the Android ecosystem is. So I'm just going to give a kind of a brief overview to kind of level set with everyone. So I've mentioned maybe APKs in this talk already. And so it's just a package format for what um, Android apps are actually um, built into. Um, so, but you can think of APKs literally as a zip file. And if you were actually to decompress or unzip the file, this is what it'll look like over the diagram um, behind me. You'll see things like the Android manifest, resources, which may be like assets as images, um, the library, the source code, um, and some of the properties. And so I'm going to kind of use this diagram to kind of walk us through some of the analysis methods that we use to try to determine the use of safety net, at least in our initial approach. So the first thing that we checked was like the existence of a properties file. So some Android apps will have this properties file that provides some type of configuration to their app. It's an INI format, and it's something that's not required, but it's optional. Um, but what we saw was in a lot of the apps that, um, that use SafetyNet actually had these properties file that laid out um, not only the service that they were using, but also the version of the uh, library of SafetyNet that they had. But again, it's important to note that this is not required, but something that we saw and is a good first heuristic. It's a very kind of high level check that we can use because um, all we have to do is unzip uh, the APK and kind of look for the existence of the properties file and analyze its contents. The next thing that we happened to look at was the Android manifest. And again, for people who aren't familiar, the Android manifest is kind of like this powerhouse kind of file of the, of the APK. It provides like a lot of information there. Um, some of the things that are in there are like content providers, some of the permissions that the app is going to request to, to actually be used properly. Um, and also there's going to be maybe things um, associated with like the hardware or the software that is required to actually run this app. As it relates to this talk and kind of our research, some things that we found that were pretty interesting that people had were their station API keys um, that were available in this particular Android manifest. And so there are two particular API keys that we were um, kind of patterns that we saw. Um, one was like the attestation API key, um, and the other one was a general API key. So these are kind of used to make sure like uh, they're actually meeting the quota of the usage associated with uh, safety net. Um, also, there are other ways to kind of implement kind of providing these particular keys, um, but these are two popular ones that you'll find in like most tutorials and trying to kind of establish this. Again, that particular check is pretty easy. Again, it's kind of following the same format of unzipping the APK, uh, looking for the presence of this file, examining the XML to find these particular, uh, particular API keys um, and their existence. The last check that I'm kind of talking about in this initial approach is a little bit more intensive, and this is the classes.dex file. And this dex file is like Dalvik in Dalvik executable format, and it actually contains the compiled, like not only like code that the developer wrote, but also the libraries that they're using. Um, and the cool thing about this is that you can actually access some of the strings and method definitions without trying to decompile the DEX file. So it's a very easy way of kind of checking for some methods that you know associated with safety net. But you can actually go a little bit further and actually decompile that into some Java representation of the code, which can be really useful if you want to kind of look, okay, so this per a particular method is calling the attest API um, that the developer wrote, and you can kind of walk through that. So that was kind of, some of the, one of the approaches that we took. So okay, I've kind of walked through three different approaches and some heuristics that are pretty easy to check for the use of safety net. So now I'm going to kind of talk through some of the results that we found. 
So through our corpus of apps, we found about 4% of apps were using some version of safety net. And I'm going to talk through some of the different categories and kind of uh, verticals that we're using it. So our initial hypothesis was that we're going to find uh, finance apps and games that were using safety net that most, are most prevalent in those particular categories. And the reason for that that we thought was because finance um, applications want to make sure that this is a genuine Android device because maybe you're making, messing with people's transaction data or maybe actually access to people's money. And then as a result, uh, as a relevant to games, they want to make sure that people aren't cheating or abusing their apps. And so some of that did hold true. We found that a little bit over 18% of uh, finance apps were using this. Um, the most surprising results you might see is like, why are comics up here? Um, as it relates to Android Rank, kind of doing some analysis of the apps that we downloaded, most of them can maybe be categorized as games, um, but there were some general like comics apps, and then maybe uh, one hypothesis surrounding why comics may be so high, uh, maybe just because of the original content, we don't want people are stealing that. But some other categories that were on here are dating uh, and shopping. If we were to add um, comics to game, it would probably go to like number four, um, but we wanted to kind of align with the official categories that were uh, given by Android Rank. So there are obviously some limitations with our initial approach. Um, if you're using time, any type of string matching or regex, it's going to be pretty brittle. <laughs> and there are going to be a lot of false negatives. So maybe somebody is um, clarif uh, defining this method in a different way. Maybe their API key is, uh, is stored in a different format. And so that's an like, obvious problem. And the next thing is like searching for strings doesn't really work when your code is obfuscated. And that happens when people release apps. Um, so Garrett, all the checks will pretty much fail at that level. And then one of the things associated with this initial method is our results were kind of biased towards these official approaches of people storing their uh, API keys in a certain way, or maybe they have a properties file. Uh, so we kind of took a step back and we're like, maybe we can do better. We should kind of do a literature review and kind of see where some of the other methods after kind of using these first heuristics. So now I'm going to kind of talk about what our next step was. So we went from strings to really what I would call static analysis. So during our literature review, we found that there was a lot of like prior research in terms of um, methods and people trying to detect the use of third-party libraries. There are a lot of good papers out there. Um, two that I actually found really good were a um, paper on called LibScout and another called on LibPecker. Um, but you can kind of choose your tool of choice. We ended up going with LibScout because it's pretty easy to kind of instrument in terms of kind of conducting it at this scale. So going and actually diving into the details of how LibScout does third-party um, library analysis is a little bit beyond the scope of this talk. but I highly recommend go reading the paper. Um, there's actually a cool application of using LibScout um, across a gigantic course of corpus of apps to detect the use of prior or older libraries that had vulnerabilities in it. Um, so there's actually some really good research there that I hope you check out. But at a high level, LibScout works by first um, extracting, oh, let me take a step back. You must have like a previous or kind of current version of a particular library. And so using that particular library, it tries to extract a profile um, from that jar that you provided. So in our case, we provided the several versions of the safety net library. The next thing that you have to do is actually provide the app that you want to, to analyze. It then it provides a, um, it extracts another profile for that. And then it applies their matching algorithm, which outputs a simulator score between 0 and 1. So using this, we actually tried to have like a very high threshold of above 0.9. That's because we wanted to kind of eliminate as many false positives as possible. So the results from LibScout were a little bit higher. We found that about 7.1% of apps were using the SafeNet library. Um, and actually kind of going with our initial hypothesis, we found that about 11.2% of games were using the SafeNet. One of the interesting things is because we were using, um, we uploaded all the different versions of SafetyNet, I think since, point, since 7, uh, we were able to see like, okay, what are the distribution of, ca of apps that were using a, a particular version of SafetyNet? And what we found during our analysis is that about 87% of apps were using an older version of the SafetyNet library, which is particularly interesting. Um, I guess for context, the latest version is the 17 was released back in June. And there are like many reasons why a developer may not be using this, the latest version of a library. Maybe they haven't tested it and kind of seen how it will operate in their app. Um, so it's not necessarily out of negligence in this case. But we want to also talk about general limitations because that's really important. So there is some prior art in terms of uh, trying to analyze the use of safety net um, among Android apps. And it was actually some research that was published in 2017 by NowSecure. Their corpus is pretty different than ours. Um, they didn't release like, what apps that they use, and it was about 3,000 applications of popular apps. 
So you can't necessarily compare that. Um, our results to theirs is because we it won't be an apples to apples comparison. The next thing you want to say is it, to be very careful about generalizing our results um, because, again, this was not a random sample of Android apps. Um, this was um, a curated list from very popular Android apps. So maybe there is some correlation between the use of safety net for popular apps. Um, they may not um, kind of pervade the entire Android ecosystem. So you just kind of want to put that caveat out there. So now I'm going to turn it over to Nick to talk about some of the tooling that we created as part of this project. Thanks. So we're releasing a couple open source tools along with this talk. Um, there are three parts. One is a, just an Android example application that requests a safety net attestation and posts the result to a server. Uh, another thing we're releasing is the server-side component of that, which is basically just a little Flask application that implements this very common but incorrect pattern of certificate chain validation. Along with that, we're introducing a couple tools to make testing for this vulnerability easier, um, especially if you have like a man-in-the-middle position. I also want to talk quickly about forging safety net attestations with the disclaimer that this isn't really a vulnerability in safety net. It's an issue with what safety net is asking developers to do, given the tools that they have access to and the advice that they're going to find when they're trying to do this. If we'd like to forge a safety net attestation, we can do this by modifying that JWS in flight to inject our own rogue certificate authority into that Jose header. So an example of this is you know, maybe we have a device that is rooted that isn't going to pa pass the safety net check. We can set basic integrity and CTS profile match, those two options that determine whether a device is rooted to true, um, and we can get away with it. Uh, in flight, we resign this payload with our own rogue certificate private key. We swap out the JWS signature and send it on its way. The tools that we're releasing are really sort of three separate tools. Um, the first is uh, a small Python utility to help you generate a, a rogue certificate authority uh, and self-signed certificate, or rather, rogue self-signed certificate authorities and then leaf certificates issued by that authority, um, as well as signing arbitrary payloads with those leaf certificates. Uh, there's also some tooling that allows you to extract and modify JWS requests in flight, uh, applying uh, an arbitrary transformation function to the contents of that JWS payload. Uh, as well as automatically re-signing uh, and modifying that X509 chain. We've also turned this into a Metam proxy add-on. Um, so can we cut over to the demo? So just to show what's happening here, this is a request to our server, or our Flask application, using a standard non-modified uh, version of safety net. Uh, we have a valid leaf, a valid signature, and we can see this device is rooted, and it's failed these checks. We can also see that the intermediate uh, issuer here is, uh, in fact, global sign, which is a legitimate certificate authority. If we instantiate our Metam proxy script and we make that same request, we can see this request come through again. We'll see again we have a valid leaf and a valid signature. Uh, interestingly enough, the issuer of this intermediate is our Chain of Fools rogue CA. Um, everything passes, and now this device is listed as not rooted. <laughs> um, can we cut back to the slides, please? So just a couple points I want to conclude with. Um, ideally, developers shouldn't have to worry about cryptographic implementation details like validating certificate chains. Frameworks and vendor tooling should abstract this, as much, uh, abstract this away as much as possible. If you are asking developers to do cryptography and you don't expect them to be cryptographic experts, try to choose misuse-resistant misuse primitives and APIs. It's also relatively easy to take advantage of incorrect certificate chain validation logic. Um, and we have reason to believe that this is a pattern that is implemented in the wild somewhat frequently. Forging safety net attestations is this one example. Um, like we said, other examples of popular APIs that require this uh, implementation are Android protected confirmations, uh, WebAuthn token provenance attestation, uh, and I'm sure that there are much more. We've also learned that safety net usage is steadily increasing, uh, with gaming and finance being the biggest adopters. Um, and also that certificate chain validation is hard to get right. 
right? It's totally easy to dunk on people that are getting this wrong, um, but we have to think about the tools that they have access to. Um, and we're really in the position where we can build better tools so stuff like this doesn't happen. Thanks so much. I also actually wanted to just add the one note that if you're trying to look for this pattern maybe in your, your own code bases that you've deployed, um, we've had really good luck just grepping for like, the functions that are used to validate certificate chains. There's all sorts of stuff you could do with like AST parsing, um, but we've had a good number of hits just uh, with grep. Cool. cool. Questions? Hello, Charles. Sure. Yeah. Oh, uh, hello, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you can put the, the slide with the link to the place where you released the, the code. Yeah, absolutely. And we probably should have had that in the... Uh, you, oh, it's in the... Do you have the clicker? Yeah. Oh, right. Where is the <laughs> clicker? Do you want to find it? Sure. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Would you say having security champions on the teams dealing with cryptography, you know, cryptography issues, help mitigate a lot of the things you mentioned today, or have application security team, you know, help on the sprint of the team development team working on something involving cryptography? I mean, as you mentioned, developers don't necessarily have the experience in cryptography, where security champions and application security experts can potentially help them. Would you say that's a good way to solve these things? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say that anytime you have a development team with the resources to have uh, the involvement of a dedicated AppSec team, you're going to get better outcomes. Um, Security Champions is definitely a strategy that, that works to do that. Um, this is definitely not an issue that uh, is impossible to find by any means. It's just something that might not be obvious if you're you know, like a single shop developer. So you talked a lot about the safety net and their, what at least my understanding, lack of uh, developer support here. But safety net and uh, Google actually publishes both the Java and C sharp uh, example implementations. Mm -hmm. Do you see the same problems there, or is this really a lack of crypto support in Python? They actually have yeah great application or great uh, libraries as examples there. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really an example of them doing that that kind of. Uh, thing we talked about in the conclusion, where if people are asking developers to implement these cryptographic checks to provide these, these tools. Yep. Ultimately, I still think that uh, you could make the developer's job easier in those cases. Um, but I would also totally agree with you that Python specifically has this issue, and that the PyOpen SSL bindings aren't sufficient for the specific task. Yeah, we also see Golang as a, you know, an example as well, where it's improperly used pretty regularly. Thank you very much for the talk, and it's very good for mitigating coding issues. Did you ever try to fool or hide an applica malicious application directly on the phone without an external proxy? How would you do that? Yeah, you could do that as well. Um, the proxy is just one example. If you were able to uh, hook into that call to basically send off that attestation, or even just hook into the safety net libraries uh, mm -hmm. when the application is requesting attestation, Pretty much anywhere you can get yourself in the middle of that flow is going to work. Yeah, we, um, so we have a, a paper also that we are releasing with this, which describes how um, uh, one of our other uh, colleagues had used, um, how, what was the? It Frida. Was Frida, yeah. So the uh, Frida.re, I think, is the, <laughs> but uh, so, so like a, um, for, for doing in proc uh, hooking to modify JWS, the safety net JWS. So uh, another question. So I'm not familiar to, with the safe net. So is it always uh, going over the unencrypted channel with HTTP as a request and uh, receiving the response? And the second question, um, is it possible to use the built-in mechanism of the operating system like Android to do the task of verification? Because we forget here about very important tasks as verification of the extensions, verification of the critical extensions, as, as well the CRLs and OCSP. Mm -hmm. And another one? 
how, why not to build the chain uh, of the certificates based on the AIA info information? Sure. So I think your first question was, is it common to use HTTP for this? Yeah. No. Um, this is an easy example for us. Uh, really, that flow between how your app communicates the JWS payload back to the back end is totally app dependent. Uh, TLS would protect against uh, man in the middle style attacks here. Uh, your second question was, why don't we use Android's uh, basically OS features to do some of these checks? The reason for that is that in this case, SafetyNet basically explicitly treats the device, like the mobile device, as untrusted. Right? You can't trust the mobile device to attest its own health without doing some checks server side. Yeah. Uh, so that's why we can't rely on those properties. Um, yeah. And I've forgotten your third question. Yeah, but uh, but uh, during the test of the certificate chain, not that the device is rigged or not, we are testing the response from the safe net. If this one is uh, verified correctly, if it's not spoofed, so why not to allow the device which want want to be tested properly if it's uh, not uh, or it's using the store that you that you have inside, or is that uh, you use the safe net to verify if it was uh, not rigged on the level of the certificate store as well? I'm not sure I totally understand the. Uh, uh yeah, we can we can, ch we chat, can about chat about, about it after. Yep, yep. I, I, ideally, the <laughs> you know in the in the sort of yeah. happy path, the Android application is just going to reach out to Google's servers. It's going to make this claim. It's going to get it signed by Google, and it's going to send it back, right? So that that is what it's doing normally. Um, it's just that you can take that payload, which may successfully indicate that that device is rooted, and you can modify that. Yep. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, just wanted to say that um, I'm surprised to see how many applications actually use certificate change and validation because if, if the application knows beforehand the identity that it wants to talk to, the server that it wants to talk to, then wouldn't the uh, uh, certificate pinning be the better solution? So in this case, uh, the certificate chain validation isn't used to protect, uh, like, for example, the TLS connection between an app and the back end. It's actually because the mobile device is responsible for reaching out to Google and asking for an attestation of the device's health. Right? But the server isn't talking directly to Google. So the server, the back end, needs a way to validate that this attestation legitimately came from Google. And so that's why this question is here. Um, interestingly enough, SafetyNet actually also provides an online API for this. Um, but they basically very clearly say uh, you can only use this during development. Do not ship this with your production apps. Yeah, it's like highly rate limited as well. Yeah. I think we have time for maybe one more quick question. Yeah. Or none. Thank you so right, much. Thank you. Thank you all.